We continue then the seva, seva of reading Bhagavad Gita. It's a seva done for Guru Dev and therefore a seva done for Radharani and therefore a seva done for Radhamon. But it's also a seva done for you, my brothers and sisters. Um, it's a seva to the Prema Shakti in you, to the love in your hearts, the divine love in your hearts. And the aim of, of this reading is together is to serve you, to serve Gurudev, so that he can serve Radharani. And then we can all take the smallest baby steps toward uh, Manjari Bhav. And my approach has always been, and I'm feeling it in more and more, it's been to read not with my mind, but with my, with my heart to try to feel the words, feel what's happening in the text, feel the beauty of the text, feel the poetry in, in the text. And that's what I hope I can help you to do too. I think that's what we need to do, not to read with our brains, but to read with our hearts and to feel. So in the best um, situation, I would just erase myself. And become just kind of a pot, a vessel that would carry this love from Bhagavad Gita into into your into your hearts. I have really nothing to say about it. I just have things that I feel about it. Hmm. Uh, Guru Dev's instruction from now. It's been seventeen weeks. It's the seventeenth week today. Guru Dev's instruction was to understand Bhagavad Gita as an introduction to Bhakti and an introduction to understanding how Radha Mohan is already appearing, that how Krishna in many ways is already taking the form of Radha Mohan in Bhagavad Gita, so long before Chaitanya Mahaprabhu ever, ever came, even though he was uh, an idea and there were lots of um, pre-thought of, of him, her, long uh, before. So helping us to understand the how important the energy of divine love is in all of the Vedas, in all of the history of Indian thought. And the goddess of Prema, the goddess of divine love, Radha, is always present. And I think we've seen so much evidence already. It's, I, I almost want to stop today and say it's proven, it's scientific now. <laughs> But I think it's quite inspiring to continue to read and to see the different ways that uh, the flow of the goddess of love is 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 everywhere in 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 Bhagavad Gita. Um, last time we last time we spent the whole time on verse twenty six. We spent lots of time because it's very important verse. And also because uh, the Prabhupada's commentary is very is very long, actually. If you remember, it was all about the offering. What's happening when we offer to Krishna? And I think uh, we managed in, we managed to to see to find how we have the the cycle of devotional love happening within the offering. In some ways, we managed to prove the, the presence of Radha Mohan and Radha, Radha Rani's Prem Shakti in this idea about the offering. So it started out talking, you remember, about how little we need to offer in order to make Krishna happy. One leaf, one little bit of water, one little thing is okay, because the idea of the offering is not what we offer, but the way we offer. The way we, the spirit with which we offer, the um, the sincerity with which we offer, the consciousness with which we offer. So, if we offer even the smallest thing, but we do it with a pure heart, a sincere heart, then that is what pleases Krishna. And then we talked a little bit about what that might look like, a pure heart, because we all are seeking this. 
And the answer that I tried to give and develop a bit was that uh, pure heart looks like Radha's heart, Radharani's heart. And to understand what, to have some feeling for what Radharani's heart looks like, for that we try to seek Mantri Bhav. And we try to look at the Leelas and we try to follow our good Guru Manjari and see and witness, not through intelligence, but through sharing the feelings, what Radha's love looks like. Impossible for us to obtain, but we can get close and closer and closer. And this is our path to be more perfect Manjaris and to become closer and closer to the love, the pure uh, divine love, which is Radharani. And this offering process we talked about was, was then part of this getting closer to Radharani's heart. Right? Because in, in a sense, we can only give our offering to, to Krishna when our heart is pure, when our heart is full of love, when our heart, when the love in our hearts is sincere and, and pure. And the more we do that, the more Radharani's love is supported and nourished, the more love she gives to Krishna, to sorry, to Mohan, and the more love comes back to us. So this is a, it's, a, it's a circle. All love starts with Radharani, and ultimately all love goes back to Radharani. I'm really so happy to hear in the, in the classes from these last weeks, this idea is coming back and with, in many people's mouths. But the love we feel in our hearts comes from Radharani, and the love we give finds its way back to Radharani. And this was the same as we saw in the offerings that we give to, to Radha Mohan. The goods, the, the goods of nature come from Radha Mohan, and they ultimately go back to Radha Mohan. So it's a closed circle of love and devotion. And that's really, I tried to say last time, I don't know if I was very convincing, but I tried to say last time, this is already proof that Radha Mohan, the, the enjoyer, and the beloved, the lover and the beloved are already very clearly present in, in Bhagavad Gita. What Prabhupada says only makes sense if it refers to Radha Mohan, because you have to have you have to have a giver of love and you have to have a receiver of love, an enjoyer of love. And then our place in that circle is to help to make it flow. And then we talked a little bit about, I was looking at last time, just, we talked a little bit about um, senses, transcendental senses, what it means to feel transcendentally the way that Dada and Mohan uh, do. And that the beauty of the world that we see, the material world, is only possible because Radha Mohan senses with transcendental senses the beauty of the world. So there has to be some pleasure. There has to be some pleasure received by Mohan, and there has to be pleasure given by Radha. So all the origin of everything that's beautiful, that we find with our material senses beautiful in the world, is somehow in that cycle of Radha, Radha giving pleasure to Mohan and Mohan receiving the pleasure. So creating beauty, and enjoying beauty. This is the part of the cycle that we're, we're supporting by supporting our, our Guru Manjari and uh, all Manjaris and thereby supporting Radharani. So there is kind of a summary of last time it was so rich and complex that it's difficult, but that's what I think we, we ended with. Now today we're going to um, continue with uh, verse 27 and 28, and then the really very important verses 29 and 30. I hope we get that far today. I'll try not to um, take too long. So we... I'll show you...
Well, no, we did those. No, sorry, we did those two already. Good. So we'll go to 29. I'm sorry. Did we? Where did we stop? 27. It was 27, yes. Okay, let's have a look at 27 here. Um, share it with you. And there's verse 27. So the verse says, here it is down there, O son of Kunti, Arjuna, of course, all that you do, all that you eat, all that you offer and give away, as well as all austerities that you may perform, should be done as an offering unto me. So we're continuing on the theme of the, of the offering. We weren't quite done with it yet. And then there's a very short purport. Prabhupada says, Thus it is the duty of everyone to mold his or her life in such a way that he or she will not forget Krishna in any circumstance. This is maybe a definition of Krishna consciousness. That every part of our life, the thought of Krishna, of Radha Mohan, is present and guiding our activities, our thoughts, and our feelings. So to for, not to forget Krishna means not to forget that we are divine, that we have a soul, and that soul is part and parcel of Krishna's soul, and that everything we do should be um, should be expressing that. And Prabhupada goes on, everyone has to work for maintenance of his body and soul together. And Krishna recommends herein that one should work for him. Everyone has to work for maintenance of body and soul together. This means, I think, that we need to embrace the fact that we are material beings with spiritual aspirations. As we said before, we have one foot in the spiritual world, one foot in the material world. We're living in, in material bodies, but we're here together and talking and, and doing practice together because we feel our spiritual, our svarup as well. It's not completely realized, but we have a suspicion that it's there. We feel something there and we're trying to move closer to it. Prabhupada says we need to care for both of these sides of ourselves, both the body and the soul. And devotion, I think, devotion exactly means using our bodies to further the soul. To use our bodies to do things in the material world, to do seva, above all, to, to serve and to, to, to help others in order to further the soul. And in a way, we can only do this with, because we have a body. So the body is not to be considered as something evil, something corrupt or secondary, as we probably have in, in the Abrahamic religions, in Christianity or, or Islam or Judaism. The body has a very important function. Devotion can only be carried out through the body. So we need to find material experiences, and that's what we do in our practice, that will increase our consciousness. We can carry our hearts with our feet to different temples. We can carry our hearts to meet other sadhus. We can carry our hearts with our feet to associate with other devotees, to have good experiences, all in the aim of increasing our consciousness of the soul. So this is what seva is, in a way. It's action taken by the body that, that increases, that intensifies the presence of the soul, that in intensifies the presence of love. Any action of the body that increases love to anyone, 
anywhere. By baking a cake, by visiting your grandmother, by bathing your children, by embracing your, your husband. All of these actions that increase love, that make the other feel more love, is already doing progress towards increased spiritual consciousness, consciousness of the soul. There's so many thousands of things we can do every moment, every day, in order to increase love. And this is what we, we need to do in order to, to increase our devotional um, activity. Or any action that decreases ego, that weakens ego. And ego stands in the way of love. Any action that we do that weakens our ego is also increasing the intensity of our consciousness of the soul. Um, Prabhupada continues then, everyone has to eat something to live. Therefore, he should accept the remnants of the foodstuffs offered to Krishna. Any civilized man, or let's say a woman, a woman, because we're also in 2022 here, has to perform some religious ritualistic ceremonies, the kind that we sometimes look at as being mechanical or dry or cold. But everyone has to do something of this, Prabhupada says. And then he continues, therefore, Krishna recommends, do it for me. And this is called archana. So it's fine that we have to do meaningless tasks or, or ritualistic actions. It's just fine. The clue is, do it for Krishna. Do it with the thought of God. Do it for the purpose of increasing consciousness of God. Arch archana just, just means um, uh, worship worship or praise. So, and it's an idea we uh, we talked about before. It doesn't matter who we do the worship for, actually. It could be for demigods. It could be for, uh, it could be for um, uh, other sorts of, of deities. But all of that worship ultimately comes back to Krishna. Again, alpha, the Alpha and Omega. Krishna is the beginning and the end. And anything we do that is positive and devotional in this world ultimately finds its way, that energy finds its way back to, to Krishna. Prabhupada goes on, everyone has a tendency to give something in charity. Krishna says, give it to me. And this means that all surplus money accumulated should be utilized in furthering the Krishna consciousness movement. But this can also mean many things, of course. It doesn't really matter what you do with your money as long as you're doing it with, uh, in the spirit of devotion. And as long as you're doing it for Krishna, as long as you're giving it to Krishna. Whether it means uh, driving your car to, to carry some food to your grandmother, or whether you're, whether you're making dinner for your, your wife, or whether you're, whether you're, you're cleaning up um, your house, all of these things done in the thought of Krishna, raise the spirit of devotion. And then finally, uh, Prabhupada says, nowadays, people are very much inclined to do the meditational process, which is not practical in this age. But if anyone practices meditating on Krishna 24 hours, by chanting the Hare Krishna mantra around his beads, he is surely the greatest yogi, as substantiated by the sixth chapter of Bhagavad Gita. So what he's saying is that we, it's very impractical to only think about Krishna without any other activity. But if we manage to do this, we can make great progress. We can make great progress in the in increasing our consciousness of spirit.
And verse 28. In this way, you will be freed from all reactions to good and evil deeds. And by this principle of renunciation, you will be liberated and come to me. In this way, you will be freed from all reactions to good and evil deeds. And by this principle of renunciation, you will be liberated and come to me. So several things that are really, really wonderful here. One is the idea of good and evil. Now we're going to come back to that later in verse 29 and 30, verses 29 and 30. This idea of morality, which has no place in Krishna consciousness. And I'll try to explain why that's the case, that morality is an external governing force. It's never internal. And then the second idea is that's very special about the way Prabhupada um, speaks and preaches is uh, renunciation. Sannyasa, you can see you can see the word here, sannyasa. He's talking about, and you know the you know very well this word. And we think about <laughs> excuse me. <clears throat> we think about the orange, orange dressed men and sometimes women who have given up all all uh, all earthly pleasures in order to focus their devotion. But it doesn't need to mean that according to Prabhupada. He also calls renunciation something different, namely renouncing all thought which is not dedicated to Krishna. So we can clearly go on, according to Prabhupada, being a carpenter or a plumber or a teacher and be renounce, renounced as long as we dedicate that work that we do to, to Krishna. And then, of course, you know this, you know this story that if we offer ourselves this way, then we will become liberated from, from karma. That's this word uh, mukto. You, from, I'm sure you're familiar with that means liberation, of course, here. Mukto. But vi mukto then means higher liberation, liberation rising to, to the level of God. And Prabhupada means that this this the activities of bhakti can bring us to this higher liberation. And how? Well, it's not the rituals. We've said it before. It's not the rituals and the dry uh, activities, but rather the devotion that will lift us. And this is something Prabhupada emphasizes everywhere in the in his commentaries on the Bhagavad Gita. So he comments then, Prabhupada, one who acts in Krishna consciousness under supreme direction is called yukta. The technical term is yukta vairagya. Yukta, you know, like yoga, it's the, it's the cousin of yoga, it means union. And yukta, yukta vraigya means union with, with me, becoming one with me, becoming one with Krishna. And this is really very, very remarkable and strong. So whereas in maybe Christianity would say we, we would like to go and be close to God, in bhakti we become part of God. We are already part of God, actually, part and parcel of Krishna, as it's always said. But when we achieve, achieve yukta, union, we actually, our soul actually merges with Krishna's soul. In the spiritual world, there is no distinction between our soul and Krishna's soul. We are one. We're no longer part and parcel, but we're integrated completely. And the sorry. Papa, uh, hmm? sorry, may I ask you a small question? 
Yes. Oh uh, yeah. Uh, in, we we can read here uh, under superior. Uh, mm. What in English? Or to say direction. Under superior direction. Yes. Uh, what mean these three words, please? <laughs> the superior, the superior direction is that is that that force that calls us to lift lift ourselves up to purify our hearts, to purify our our minds. Mm. But it's not to be understood as direction like a commander, like a boss. Mm. I think I think this would be a wrong reading. I don't think that's what Prabhupada means. But it means following a guide, maybe like a guru, uh, maybe like other uh, Vaishnavas, Acharyas. So I think it means the navigator. That's how I would say it. Maybe Jainanda could help help us with this, what that superior direction is. I think Uttamaji's is the comment is correct, huh. and uh, so if Guru Dev is there, and then we follow Guru Dev's instruction and guidance. But if Guru Dev is not here, we we follow kind of sadhu mm. and bhajna. Why? Because if we do ourselves, then ego might be some ego might be active mm. and independent nature so we we ask somebody is it okay it's correct and give uh, some advice kind of uh, this kind of humble attitude and then we try to follow a superior guidance that's Radha Mohan likes it. Mm. Then our we are in the in the pleasure giving potency. We are kind of protected. But if we act independently, so we may influence our ego or external energy. It might be possible. Mm. So therefore, always we are kind of under the direction of Guru Dev and uh, Sadhu Guru, and also Shastra. We may say. Mm. So, and we take it, especially we need sadhu and mm. guru dev. And then we are kind of safe. That's, a, that's a say, because sometimes we think Krishna consciousness. So I'm Krishna conscious, we may say, but uh, we don't know reality. Mm. But other people may, may, you know, may understand, may give some more, more direction, more advice. So that kind of humble attitude mm. is uh, like a, is a, is a kind a humble attitude and love is very similar. And uh, that's my feeling. Mm. So Uddhavaji's comment is incorrect. That's very, very nice. Sundaram, thank you for the question. It's very, it's very important. Hmm? So, so our Chaitanya Krema, do you want to share? Radhe, Radhe, Yeah, uh, I also like understood, like, I just want like to add, uh, because I understood similarly. So when you read verse 27, Krishna did not tell exactly if there is sadhak or practicing person under his influence. He just tells everything you do, offer to me. Hmm. So that means, you know, I can do, but my vision is not uh, maybe so broad, or I'm also not under influence of this Uktya, like you now mentioned. So if I do from myself, I can do, like, let's say, I can work in a company, I can serve my wife, my children, my family, everything. But I'm not under this influence of higher energy. Mm. 
Hmm. So my result will be only mukya. This will be my end result. Yeah. So yeah. I have to come in in contact with this uktya. Who will say me what to do? If this uktya will say me like uh, work in the company, serve your family, and this this will have an other result. Hmm. Oh, I understand like this. Very nice. That's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and also, say, actually, many Acharya say this ninth chapter 27th is not pure, pure bhakti. Ah. It is a karma, mishra, karma mishra bhakti. Why karma mishra bhakti? Because uh, all you do, all that you do, all that you offer and uh, give to me. This is not missing point to, to please yeah. Krishna, please Mohan, please Radharani. Yeah. That is missing. So some tendency, oh, I like, so therefore I like this by I, I offer. Yeah. So mm -hmm. this tendency is a little you know, selfish nature is mixing. Okay. So therefore, the result is, is, is not the pure devotion. So therefore, this mentions this yukta. Yukta means we try to uh, to cooperate or under the guidance of superiority. Hmm. That's my, this, our ac action become more pure, more 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 connected, more selfish. That's uh, we may say. I like very much, um, Jananda, the, um, what you say about the ego. It almost uh, does not matter what the direction is, but the fact that we are directed instead of thinking that we can direct ourselves, this reduces ego, this liberates us from ego, that we surrender, it's a part of surrendering to the higher direction. Hmm. Hmm. Very good question. So then we continue with the purport on um, on um, verse twenty-eight. I would like to add something, uh, uh, Udavji. Of course. I I would like to say that the superior guidance is what you explain very nicely that every day I try to do my activities, my feeling and my, you know, desires connected with divine love. At the same time, like Jainanda Maharaj was explaining, I connect with my brothers and sisters and my Gurudev. But I think also we should not become too mechanically and be being afraid to take also some own feelings into decisions. For me, this is always a very good balance because I feel if I just uh, don't trust myself in my devotion, it can happen that uh, I don't like to take any decisions and I become like a quiet uh, follower. Hmm. But to put our individual um, talents, our individual feelings under the guidance of our hearts and our guru and guru brother, guru sisters, the shastras, that is a balanced being with an individual touch. I just want to add that because mm -hmm. thank you. Uh, it's important for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. No, okay, then we will carry on with the Rupa Goswami here. I think was the <laughs> Rupa Goswami says that I'm reading Prabhupada now. This is further explained by Rupa Goswami as follows. Rupa Goswami says that as long as we are in the material world, we have to act. We cannot cease acting. Therefore, if actions are performed and the fruits are given to Krishna, this is called yukta vairagya. 
which means coming to a spiritual union with, with God. Actually, Prabhupada continues, actually situated in renunciation, such activities clear the mirror of the mind. And as the actor gradually makes progress in spiritual realization, he or she becomes completely surrendered to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So here again, we have this very special meaning that um, Prabhupada gives to the word surrender, which is not the traditional sannyasi idea. It's surrendering one's mind, surrendering one's mind to focus concentration on, on God. And this is the final step of our progress towards realization. And these, these steps we take through our material body, performing activities with our body. Now Prabhupada says, therefore, at the end of, at the end, he becomes liberated, the devotee. And his liberation, and this liberation is also specified, it's described, in other words. By this liberation, he does not become one with, with the Brahmajyoti, with the other Brahmas, but rather enters into planet of the Supreme Lord. So Brahma, that's what we talked about early on, this total reality, the absolute reality, one of God's three aspects. The three of them were Brahma, absolute reality, Paramatma, the um, super soul, and the third was Bhagavan, the personal God. So by coming realized, uh, Prabhupada is saying, a devotee does not just melt into the reality, but he stays in a relationship with Krishna. He doesn't just uh, melt into like the sun and become part of God. He stays in a relationship with Krishna, which is a requirement in order to further enjoy the personality of, of God. If personality, if God is to have a personality, to have loving feelings, then there have to be objects of that love around him. Mm. Let's see, Prabhupada says then, it is clearly mentioned here, Mam upayasi, upayasi, he comes to me, back home, back to God, Godhead. And this is somehow the high point of bhakti. Prabhupada continues, there are five different stages of liberation. And here it is specified that the devotee who has always lived his lifetime here under the direction of the Supreme Lord, as stated, has evolved to the point where he can, after quitting this body, go back to Godhead and engage directly in the association of the Supreme Lord. So once again, it's not melting into the Supreme Lord, but having a perfect association with the Supreme Lord. <laughs> the five stages of liberation, just to remind you, I wrote them down for myself here. They start with um, Sarshtiv, achieving opulences equal to that of the Lord. Sarupya, having the form like the Lord. Samipya, living as a personal associate of the Lord. Salokya, living on a Vaikuntha planet. And Sayudya, merging into Brahman. So Prabhupada is saying that the essential one is not merging into Brahman, but having an association with Krishna, a perfect association. And here he continues the commentary. Anyone who has no other interest but to dedicate his life to the service of the Lord is actually a sannyasa, sannyasi. 
So that's this very special definition of sannyasi that Prabhupada uses. You don't need to have orange clothing, right? And uh, and not enjoy any uh, any of the material pleasures of life. You simply have to have one hundred percent concentration, focus on on uh, on uh, God. Indeed, I don't know. I heard Gurudev tell the story once. Maybe you've heard it yourselves before. That when he took sannyasi in the in South America, that he immediately found that people were telling him rules and regulations that had no feeling, and he thought that sannyasi should be all about love and loving emotion. And so he immediately said, after one day, I don't want this. I want to have something more loving. <laughs> so he immediately, our oh, God, dear Gurudev, did not um, essentially rejected this traditional understanding of san sannyasi as being a renouncement of the world in a sort of cold and dark and, and, uh, and, um, and dry uh, understanding of the world. He wanted it to be a renouncement of anything else but thoughts about love and thoughts in a loving relation. So this is very much in line, I think, with what Prabhupada is trying to say right here about dedicating one's life. No? It doesn't mean re renouncing the body, but it, re 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 it means renouncing the body to, for doing <laughs> foolish things, if you like. We're doing things that don't carry us towards a higher level of realization. Uh, Prabhupada continues, such a person always thinks of himself as an eternal servant, the sevika, dependent on the supreme will of the Lord. As such, whatever he does, he does it for the benefit of the Lord. So all, in other words, all actions that he does with his body, all activities are done in devotion. And that's time. This is what uh, Prabhupada says now too. He, all, uh, whatever action he performs, there it is, whatever action he performs, he performs it as a service to the Lord. In other words, everything he does, everything that's done with, everything it's done with the body, it's done as, as seva. Everything it's done with the mind is done as seva, as service. No movement as waste is wasted. No, um, no time is lost. Like uh, Gaurasundara tells us, uh, repeats and tells us that there's no time. It's urgent. This is this is one way of understanding that. No time to waste. All. Time must be used for focusing on devotion. No energy should be wasted. No, no, no space should be wasted. Everything should be saturated with devotional love. Every move of our finger, every button we press with the finger on our telephone should be filled with love, devotional love. Nothing... Um, how should I say? Nothing is not love. That's what sannyasi means for, for Prabhupada. Nothing is not love. And to say just that, to say that nothing is not love, that everything is love, is to say that the Radharani is everywhere. Radharani is in every move we make when we're in this mode of sannyasi that, that Prabhupada is describing. It means that the Radharani is there, providing loving energy in everything in everything we, we do. So Prabhupada continues a bit more on this verse. He says, the sannyasi, he does not give serious attention to the fruitive, act, fruitive, fruitive activities or prescribed duties mentioned in the Vedas. And we remember a fruitive activity, that's something that can be enjoyed after we're done with the activity. So like when we, when we bake a cake for the sake of a cake, and then we enjoy the cake. It was a fruit, and once the cake is eaten up, well, I'm sorry, 
the devotional purpose of the making the cake has disappeared as well, is eaten up as well. So in a fruitive activity, all the meaning is in the fruit. All the meaning is in the result or the product. Once the soup is made and eaten, there's nothing left. Once a task is done, there's nothing left of meaning. But the difference between that and <clears throat> devotional service is that the meaning of devotional service is never uh, consumed. The love that you give to your child, the love that you give to your child is never consumed, never used up. It's always there. It's the best investment. If you're an investment thinker, then it's the best investment you can make in the world, giving love to someone, above all a child. The love you mobilize for a child is never, ever lost. You can spend all your money on clothes and make all the cakes you want and uh, prepare all the meals and do everything you can, but these will all be gone. And what will remain is, is the love. It's never exhausted. Prabhupada continues here. For ordinary persons, it's obligatory to execute the prescribed duties mentioned in the Vedas. So we have to follow the rule book, ordinary people. But although a pure devotee who is completely engaged in the service of the Lord may sometimes appear to go against the prescribed Vedic duties, actually, it is not so. Now we're moving towards, towards this discussion that's very interesting in the next two verses about morality. And it's about doing right and wrong. When we don't follow the, when we don't follow the Vedas to the very last detail, are we being evil? Are we committing sin? That's the question he's developing here, Prabhupada. And the answer to this, the solution is, you're probably guessing already, is that it, it's actually not so important what we do, even if it's so-called sinful, as long as we do it with pure, devoted heart. As long as intention is pure and action is pure, there is no right or wrong for devotee. And he'll say this explicitly in the next uh, purport of the purport of verse first um 30 i think <laughs> sorry since the only point the only goal of any action for a devotee is to increase love there's no bad way to do that as long as our actions lead lead to increasing love in the world then they cannot be called either good or bad the pure devotee can only increase devotion. So then finally, Prabhupada says, <clears throat> it's said, therefore, by Vaishnava authorities, that even the most intelligent person cannot understand the plans and activities of a pure devotee. The, vais, the, the exact words are Vaishnavera Kriya Mudravinya Nabudya. But this is actually good news for us, isn't it? Because it's not about understanding the plans and activities of a, of a pure devotee. It's about feeling them. It's about feeling them. This little verse is um, very famous in the Vedas. Vaishnavera Kriya Mudra Vinya Nabudya. It's cited several times in the Bhagavatam. It's in also in uh, Chaitanya Charitamrita in the Madhya Lila. And it says to translate to translate uh, literally, it says a pure devotee does not live on intellectual plane, but on the plane of feeling. A pure devotee is not intellectual, but feeling. And morality in that way is intellectual. The rights and wrongs of the Vaishnavas from the traditional Vedic um, traditions are about the intellect and the devotee. The devotee is about 
is about um, feeling. Bhakti is, what should I say, spiritual intelligence. I once saw that the translated bhakti translated as wise love. That's very nice. Wise love. So just like we can't understand bhakti through books and logic, we can't understand pure devotees through intelligence. That's what this verse is, is telling us. Finally, from Prabhupada, a person who is <clears throat> always engaged in the service of the Lord, or always thinking and planning how to serve the Lord, is to be considered completely liberated at present and in the future. So that's really quite extraordinary. Let's pause there and, and feel what that means. How radical that is relative to, compared to traditional Vedic thinking. Anybody, a devotee who's living in a material body, maybe even living a completely ordinary life, but who's always thinking and planning how to serve the Lord, is completely liberated. You don't have to be completely in the spiritual world. You don't have to be without a body. You can live a life and be a liberated person. <coughs> Such a devotee is always thinking, but thinking with his heart or her heart. Always acting, but acting with love. In love. Always acting together with Radharani. So then the last line of the purport here is, he's going home back to Godhead, is guaranteed. So a, a devotee like this. He's above all materialistic criticism, just as Krishna is above all criticism. So that might be a stopping point or a pause point if we want to, if anyone wants to share or... Udraji. Radhe, Radhe. Radhe, Radhe. Uh, I will return to the beginning of this commentary. I want to continue the thoughts of Suniti Vivit because I like it what she thought, she shared. One who acts in Krishna consciousness under superior direction is called Yukta. This is under superior direction. <clears throat> we have two uh, kind of directions, from outside and from inside. In the top most of service, on the top of level of service, actually, the best is direction from inside. Our dev told, if we have, we know uh, difference between Manjari and Kinkari. What's the difference? Kinkari always knows what to do for Srimadhyay Radhika. In the same time, it needs direction, external direction. In our life, we always meet in such situation, what from outside coming direction, it seems correct, but heart is telling different. If you not follow the heart, problem. I just yesterday I met such met such situation. And from outside I receive one direction, but my heart told completely different. But I want to add about this. And I want to add about sannyasa. Sannyasa, I discussed this one how say Sanskritolog, who is learning Sanskrit. What does it mean from Sanskrit? It can be described as sat -nyas or sam -nyas. sat -nyas means to renounce everything for the sat. What's, what is the sat for soul? Jaiva Dharma means to serve Ishtadeva. If someone will leave everything for this, it's real sannyas. It's what's written here in the comment. sam -nyas means to renounce everything. He read it left everything for the service. It's also sannyas. It's what's about sannyas. And the nice example of this, our Gurudev, because he left 
how uh, written here the prescribed Vedic duties because he was sannyasi, he was in Varnashrama. And uh, according to Varnashrama, not possible to learn sannyas. <laughs> but he did it. Why? Because he, he, he told to me, I don't want any Abhiman, I want only one Abhiman, rather than he. This means for the sad, for the, his eternal service to Srimacharya, he left everything that is not eternal. But I want to add. Okay, I want to do a little bit harder. Yes, yes. This, uh, this man, Upai Shashi. Man Upanishadji is different translation, but Upa means very near. So Upanishadji means very come to near. Hmm. And Natarasa uh, Snanidi, uh, Anantas Baba mentioned two kinds of chanting. Chanting with mechanical chanting, or not, not mechanical, he said, ordinary chanting. One chanting is ordinary chanting. And second type of chanting is chanting with love. So, ordinary chanting, he can go to go back to go to head. But chanting with love means this kind of raga, raga nuga love. Yeah. Or, or rupa nuga love. That person going to very near in the service of Nikunja Seva. Baba said, sorry, this is maybe beyond the Gita's description, but there's a different, uh, di different type of nearness. Just to go, you mentioned five types of liberation, especially four, ty four types of liberation, except uh, merging into the road. Like Sayuja Mukti is not at all recommended. Out of four types, is maybe okay. It's okay. But uh, even even very near, also, you know, different kind of nearness. Hmm. Baba said, most nearest intimate seva is, is a Nikunja seva. Hmm. So this is not to. Uh, and also, uh, Radha Charampabha said, Guru Dev's acting, maybe some people may say, oh, this is not uh, good to, 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 to give up sannyas. Like Radha Charampab also, many people criticize, no, you are not, you, you are not uh, good. You know, some people may criticize. But this also, they say, Vaishna Kriya Mudra Vigyana Bhujya. So this, our ordinary person could not understand the heart and activity of the devotee, especially pure devotee, because they denounce for the sake of Radharani or the sake of Radha's Mohan. That is completely okay. And also, this our Raganuga Bhajan is beyond Barnashram. Hmm. Many like uh, say, Goswami, they, they don't wear Brahman thread. So they give up because Brahman thread means in the Brahmana, means in the Barnashram. But uh, dear Baba, Babaji, <laughs> or dear, you know, like Baba is beyond the kind of Barnashram Dharma. So mm -hmm. this, this is so I, just a feeling. Thank you. Very nice. Very helpful. Any other sharing? Yes, I would like to add. Thank you, Jainanda Maharaj. Very nice. Also, I fully feel it. And also, um, Radha Charan, I feel you. And um, I would even say we give up external positions or external uh, societies or friendships 
we have to give them up. I feel in whatever situation we are, in whatever dress we are, whatever body we are, but as a soul, we need the personal relationship to divine love. We want to come closer. And at a certain stage in our lives, in our you know, desire to grow, it, it seems a necessity to do the impossible. Like giving up ashram, giving up societies, giving up even reputation, because all these things, they will bind us in the circle of repeated birth and death. Is It's a feeling, right? This is how I feel. Even though I don't, at the same time, I feel not sure if the step will be um, giving the, the love that I desire or the relation but what I desire, but the risk needs to be taken to be like Gurudev gives this example naked it's a naked state of complete uh, vulnerability and Gurudev sometimes has given this example of the Leela that Krishna plays with the gopi with the gopis, this varan, varan, this close lila, when they are they are taking a bath in the Yamuna and Krishna is stealing the clothes. So he is explaining that lila that when we think we have something to cover in front of the divine, then we are still not really fully surrendered. So these situations that we have in life when everything is stripped off us, you know, may it be a, an ashram or a situation where we feel completely vulnerable. That is also the chance and the feeling to go deeper and beyond any kind of calculation. That only I want to add that this mm -hmm. I have had in my life and I'm also, at the same time, always scared of it <laughs> because it's scary. You know, you feel so vulnerable. You give up your ashram. You give up, you know, the so many people that you had in your life or the feeling what they think about you because you took another uh, step now. You want to go in the direction of Raganuga Bhakti or you take a, a teacher that they maybe don't like or whatever it is you mm -hmm. know mm -hmm. uh, but it is a step to go into a deeper relationship and that is the desire behind it and if that is the desire then i feel we are in one way or the other in the superior guidance because our desire is to go further and not to step back or to be in a how do you say the situation that feels secure but doesn't make uh, the next uh, step of surrender or something? Mm. I don't know if it makes sense to you. I just uh, wanted to share this because I also know it. I didn't give up sannyas like you, Radha Charan, but uh, yeah, we know these situations when we are all tested. Do you want to take it further now in your bhakti or you want to stay like this? And it's like, it's like uh, we need some courage to do it. Mm -hmm. Or like Jainanda Maharaj, when you were wanting to come to Vrindavan and live here and become, uh, you know, more like uh, try to take shelter of this Jiva Institute. And then Gurudev said, no, you have to go back to Japan. This is mind blowing because you just gave up this idea. You wanted to, you know, and then this comes. So these situations always happen and again and again that we have to take. The leap of faith, I would call it. <laughs> the leap of rationality. Yes, this also. <laughs> hmm. So, so Uddhavati, by your expression today, I have also one, one feeling, another, another 27th bus. Is it okay? Of course, please. So this is uh, in a purport, second and third 
line. Everyone has to work for maintenance of his body and soul together. So I was thinking this ordinary, you know, this kind of literal thing, but now I understand every, every, everybody has to work for maintenance for Sadaka Deha and Siddha Deha. Exactly. So we, yeah, we have to do Sadaka Deha Seva or work and also sit that they has work. Hmm. That's in by your inspiration today I got. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Happy for this. Uh. Okay. Anyone else? It's so nice to hear you reacting from your experiences. If not now, it's quarter past. I think it's a bit late to start on a new verse, actually. The 29 is a big deal. It's a big verse. So maybe we leave that one for next week. No, no, no. Please, please continue. Because Guru Dev is saying, you know, Guru Dev likes to hear more and more. Guru I know. <laughs> <laughs> no, Guru Dev is not, is not there, though. That's... Okay, we continue then, as with your with your mercy, Dananda. <laughs> it's getting into now a completely different matter, and that's the one about whether uh, Krishna has favorites, whether he's uh, giving favoritism to um, to devotees at the expense of others. Verse twenty nine. He says, um, I envy no one, nor am I partial to anyone. I am equal to all. So it's clear, right? No favoritism. No, everybody's equal. But, and now Krishna contradicts himself, at least from the, from, uh, the earthly point of view. But whoever renders service unto me, unto me, in devotion, is a friend, is in me, and I am also a friend to him. I envy no one, nor am I partial to anyone. I am equal to all. But whoever renders service unto me in devotion is a friend, is in me, and I am also a friend to him. Now, actually, the verse does not say is a friend. That's why I put I underscore this uh, over here. It doesn't actually say this at all. It just says teshu, which means uh, is in me. So it's a bit of a poet poetic interpretation by Prabhupada. The verse really says, whoever renders service unto me in devotion, is in me, and I am in him, which is actually quite a bit more intimate than being a friend, you might say. So that's important to point out, and it's important for what comes afterwards. Um, but like I said, it seems to be a contradiction, right? On the one hand, in the beginning sentence, Krishna says, everybody's equal. And in the second half, Krishna says, but I prefer devotees, basically. But if we step back and look at this uh, slightly differently, we can make a very meaningful sense from it. And I've, I've taken this from some commentaries I've read as well, that, that in, the, in the first half, Krishna is speaking is in his aspect of super soul, paramatma. Yeah. And from the point of view of paramatma, of super soul, all the souls are equal. All the jivas are equal, equally spiritual and equally important. Equal to all, part and parcel of all. And then in the second half, he's speaking in his aspect as Bhagwan, as the person, personality of Godhead. And as the point of view of Bhagavan, 
the loving relation comes in, and everything he feels towards devotees and that devotees feel towards him is part of the loving relation they have with him. And the more devotees love him, the more he loves devotees back. And this is variable and different from each, from devotee to devotee. But I repeat, it's also important to understand that it is really in me, he's saying. So devotees are in me, really merged with me. So then we look at the purport. Prabhupada says, one may question here that if Krishna is equal to everyone and no one is his special friend, then why does he take special interest in the devotees who are always engaged in his transcendental service? So this is the question I was asking. Prabhupada says, but this is not discrimination. It's natural. Any man in this material world may be charitably disposed, may have a charitable attitude, yet he has a special interest in his own children. The Lord claims that every living entity, in whatever form, is his son. And as such, he provides everyone with generous supply of the necessities of life. He is just like a cloud which pours rain all over, regardless whether it falls on a rock or on a land or on a water or, let's add, on a jiva. <laughs> so I think like some of the commentaries, I, I'm not, I didn't uh, find this myself. Some of the commentaries say that it's Paramatma in the first part, super soul, and in the second part, it's personality of Godhead. But we yes. can also see it another way, this contradiction. And this part I did make up. <laughs> so, Punya, do you want to have some questions? <laughs> Please, Radhe Radhe, Vaya. I had just one question came to me also, like when we heard this, what I wanted to think about, like hear what you think about it. So when I, because it says in, in me, you no, know, like what it says, it says in me. Yeah. yeah. I was just feeling a bit like with, if you are in relation with Krishna, then you have in some way also like prema, no, you have love. There is love. Mm. So I felt, is it not that everyone who is devoted, then they are in, in love, in that prema, so actually not in Krishna, but in the internal potency, so in, in that love? Ah. But that's just, I don't know what, what you feel, or like, I just want to know, so <laughs> Ananda, what, uh, if that's correct, or... So we discussed this, yeah. you, you, you missed, so we discussed this with Guru. Really? Yeah. Maybe you can say Wow. No, you're speaking. So, so can I give some little comment? Please. So I don't know, maybe, so last time, Chaitanya Puremaji asking one comment to, uh, you know, asking question to me. This mentioned, if said, if we did Sanskrit, Samoha Sarva Bhuteshu, Name Dubesho Stinapkriya. So here mentioned Priya. Yeah. You know, in Brindavan, Priya, Priya Ji means Radharani. So, can you understand this Radharani bus? Radharani? And I start thinking, oh, yes. And Guru you know, we are also talking Guru So, this in me, this is my understanding. So, Krishna. Of course, Krishna told Arjuna, but he said Priya, then he remembered Radharani. So in me, it's kind of, you know, like, uh, what do you say? It means in heart. Yeah, in heart and heart connection. Or if we say, you know, it's different understanding. This is kind of, you know, heart is meditating, like a sneha. Hmm. Or man, you know, sneha man and uh, what do you say, uh, pranaya. If you say, if you say, if you really technical thing, they kind of 
meditating and oneness. Oneness means not Brahma, you know, not Brahma Jyoti. Heart and heart is meditating. Heart and heart connection. This this very deep connection with love. Mm. So this so Uttabaji mentioned is not to mention this friend. So my understanding is that Krishna is saying to Arjuna for everybody, but he's remembering oh my Puriyaji. Mm. My Puriyaji is always render service unto me. Oh that's I'm so, so nice. Yeah. I'm so much connected. I must I must so much indebted. I want to know. I want to, you know, I want to be with her, right? you know. I want to serve her. Like kind of feeling is is covering externally. So Punyaji is is saying that's I think you know this this natural, especially we are trying to be Ragabhakta. So this this I feel, you know, Chaitanya Purema Prabhu is inspiration. This is kind of Radharani's bus. That's my feeling, honest feeling. That's so nice, such a nice reading. And so answers Punyam's question too very well, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, So oh, nice, of course. Shampriya. Shampriya is right there with him. Yeah. By the master Shampriya Punyaji become Ragabhakta. Yeah. Lovely. Um, oh yes, I was going to attack this contradiction here from another another uh, angle. Um and that was philosophical and devotional. So I would say, I was going to say that the first line we see from an external philosophical point of view. But um, Krishna is impartial externally from the relative to the external qualities of his devotees, to all the things they do and what they what they look like, what their what their color is, what their wealth or poverty is, what their height and weight is, everything that's external about them. And there he's impartial. He doesn't have prejudice. He doesn't pick one from the other. So from a philosophical point of view, or an external point of view, then Krishna is impartial. But from a bhakti point of view, from a devotional point of view, he is very partial. He loves those who love him. He supports those who who love him. He appreciates those who give love back. And he loves those like Manjaris, like, like Radharani, who support and maintain the circle of love of Radhaman, the lover and the loved. So this idea from last time that love begins with Radha, passes to Mohan, and through the devotional service of the Manjaris, Guru Manjari and us as Manjaris returns to Radha. Anyone who does helps in this process, Krishna loves and is partial, is opinionated to them. So that's maybe another way of interpreting that, that contradiction, at least. Um, But for his devotees, so right here, he gives special attention, Prabhupada says. Such devotees are mentioned here. They are always in Krishna consciousness, and therefore they are always transcendentally situated in Krishna. That's the in me, that's the teshu, I think. They're always transcendentally situated in Krishna. Their, their svarupa is... is uh, situated in uh, Krishna. And Prabhupada says the very phrase Krishna consciousness suggests that those ho who are in such consciousness are living transcendentalists situated in him. The Lord says here distinctly, 
maite in me. So this is really very interesting. If you're in Krishna consciousness, also in the, in the Sarika Deha, you are situated in, in Krishna, in me, maite. So I don't know, we could go back to this idea that um, devotees who are not fully Krishna conscious, um, who are not fully surrendered, who are not pure in their hearts, are related to him impersonally and impartially. So ordinary soul, ordinary jivas, ordinary souls in search of themselves, marginal beings, marginal souls, like we said before, they we have one foot in the material world and then, and another foot in the spiritual world. There are those who have attained Gopi Bhav, but have not realized Manjari Bhav. They have awareness of themselves as soul beings, but but not more. And uh, Krishna recognizes these, but, but he does so impartially. He sees them all as equal. And then the moment we take loving interest in Krishna, the moment we embody Radharani and thereby take loving interest, then we're engaged in real devotion and then we become favorites of Radharani. We understand that we're there to channel Prema, Prema, Prema Shakti in our lives. We're there to serve Radha, uh, Radharani. And when we serve Radharani, then we serve Radha Mohan. And and then Krishna becomes very interested in us, very partial to us. And then in, and then uh, Jainanda, the um, Prabhupada mentions the same point that you that you did actually. Let's see where is that about Priya? Uh, there it is. Naturally. As a result, the Lord is also in them, those who are loving. This is reciprocal. This also explains the words, asti na priya ye bhajan, bhajanti. So priya is the favored one. And like uh, Jainanda said, this always in Vrindavan, it always means <laughs> Radharani. And bhajanti, of course, uh, worship. So I always worship the... Um, um, the ones who are dear to me, who the ones who worship me, I, I, they are dear to me, is what it says. And then he continues, the transcendental reciprocation exists because both the Lord and the devotees are conscious, Krishna conscious, conscious of their souls. So even in material beings, in Sadika Deya, devotional relation takes place on the transcendental level, in Siddha Deya. Devotional relationships with the Radhamon happen in the spiritual form, even if we're Sadika Deya. We just imagine uh, Raghunatha Das Goswami, who's going back and forth from Siddha Deya to Sadika Deya. When we've purified our minds and our thoughts, then we can have access to this transcendental devotional relation. And that's what I think that's what Prabhupada always calls Krishna consciousness. Um, Prabhupada goes on here, when a diamond is set in a golden ring, it looks very nice. The gold is glorified. And at the same time, the diamond is glorified. So they glorify each other. The Lord and the living entity eternally glitter. And when a living entity becomes inclined to the service of the Supreme Lord, he looks like gold. The Lord is a diamond. And so this combination is very nice. Living entities in a pure state are called devotees. When a soul reaches the level of purification, that it can stand next to the gold that glitters, then it becomes more and more shiny itself. It goes back and forth. The devotee who's pure makes the Krishna shine, 
and Krishna makes the devotee shine. When we are at the heart of Krishna, when we're in Krishna, mayite, mayite, then we shine. Our love shines like Krishna's. Um, the Supreme Lord, Prabhupada says, the Supreme Lord becomes the devotee of his devotees. If a reciprocal relation relationship is not present between the devotee and the Lord, and there is no personalist philosophy, then, I'm sorry, then there is no personalist philosophy. If a reciprocal relationship is not present between the devotee and the Lord, then there is no personalist in philosophy. It's impersonal. In the impersonal philosophy, there is no reciprocation between the Supreme and the living entity. So there's no loving exchange. But in the personalist philosophy, there is. So you can say that in a way, Krishna, Krishna answers the devotional love with devotional love. And you have this circle again, this idea that it, the, the beginning of love is Radha Mohan and the end of love is Radha Mohan. And this is really, again, uh, it's a kind of proof that it's Radha Mohan who is operating in Bhagavad Gita and not some impersonal Krishna. The loving energy of Radharani is there circulating. As we deepen our love, as we deepen our experience of love as devotees, we deepen our manjari bhav, our mood of service to Radharani. And as we deepen the manjari bhav, Radha Rani deepens her love for Mohan. She acts out her love for Mohan with our help, and Mohan increases his love for his devotees. It's a beautiful circle of, of love. And then, just about coming to the end here, the example is often given that the Lord is like a desire tree. And whatever one wants from this desire tree, the Lord supplies. But the explanation is more complete. But here the explanation is more complete. The Lord is stated to be partial to the devotees. So we all know about this idea, the Vedic idea of the desire tree, that uh, it's a place where you, in the transcendental world, there's this tree where you you ask it and it gives, gets you whatever you want. It's called the uh, um, Kalpataru, Kalpataru desire tree. It's very, it's all over the place in Bhagavatam, or the Vedas themselves are compared to the desire trees. You can go to the Vedas and get any knowledge you ask for. Well, the, the desire tree for Krishna is that you get any anything you desire, any love you do, you desire. So. It, Prabhupada compares the relation to, to Krishna as one of his desire trees. Krishna is like a desire tree. He gives us anything we want as long as we love him. And then Prabhupada Guzani says, this is the manifestation of the Lord's mercy <laughs> to the devotees. The Lord's reciprocation should not be considered to be under the law of karma. It belongs to the transcendental situation in which the Lord and his devotees function. The love of Krishna is exempted from the law of karma. Why? Well, karma is the law of cause and effect. And as we said before, Krishna's devotion is um, causeless. It doesn't obey the law of cause and effect. It doesn't obey the law of karma. It breaks karma. It obeys the law of love for his devotees, in a way. And then finally, Prabhupada says, devotional service of the Lord is not an activity of this material world. It is part of the spiritual world where eternity, bliss, knowledge predominate. This is just what we said before about Sadika Deya and Siddha Deya. Even for, for Sadika Deya's 
the devotional activity is that part of activity that happens in the spiritual world. Mm. That's it's that uh, part of our activity that interacts with with the loving pastime of of Radha Mohan, and it's pushed, it's energized by the goddess of love, Radha Radha Rani. There, that completes the verse twenty nine. So I would like to give one comment. It's okay. Please, please. <clears throat> this, uh, I think, little middle part and little later, is a uh, living entity in a pure state are called devotees. The next one, the Supreme Lord becomes a devotee of his devotees. So this is my understanding. So. This this uh, Prabhupada say his devotees, but I I want to interpret this devotee is Radharani. So Krishna, so Radharani is serving Krishna, but the Krishna is you know surprising Radha's love. So Krishna want to actually Krishna was controlled by his her love Radharani's love. So Krishna want to change position. Vishaya to Ashuraya. So Krishna want to serve Radharani. That's I I I I I, I may feel this, I may understand. Say in other words, Supreme Lord become the devotee of Sri Mati Radharani. Mm, very good. Yeah. Because, yeah, because because Radha's love was so intense, so so Radha's feeling is so big, Mahababa. So Krishna was completely amazed. So Krishna became servant of Radha, servant of Radha, and also. In Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu say, Premas, two symptoms. You know, Kresha uh, Guni Shupada, one birth is there. So, Sadhana Bhakti is two symptoms, Baba Bhakti is two symptoms, and Prema Bhakti is two symptoms. One of Prema Bhakti symptoms is Prema Bhakti control Krishna. It's some of us Prema. That devotee can control Krishna. Means Krishna was under that devotee's control. That highest devotee is Radharani. So it's if we reading this one for mm. for us, so we remember Radharani. So Radharani's love is so strong. So Krishna want to. Pay obeisance to the Radharani. Krishna want to massage her, you know, his feet. Krishna touch his face, the lotus feet of Radharani. You know, this is this is kind of Buraja, like kind of our Baba. Manjari want to see Krishna is under control of Radharani. Manjari want to always Radharani support it. Manjari want to see. You know, Radharani Krishna meeting. Also, Krishna was controlled by Radharani. This Manjari want to see. Hmm. Very nice. So, yeah, very good reminder. Important. The point of this course, no? Yeah. So, 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 Chaitanya Prem want to say, please say. So, because really I was like <laughs> meditating on this verse. So for me, I'm speaking from my perspective. Sorry, rather, rather. So this point, uh, this verse clearly says, "Whoever renders service unto me in devotion is in me." That means in his heart. So which who is the top? Who has the top position? Is his heart, and he's revealing here, Priya. 
in Sanskrit, Priya, it mentions. So for me, from my perspective, mm -hmm. it's very clearly he opens his heart and admits Radharani is in the top position in my heart. Mm -hmm. So is this to us? Like Guru Dev of um, very much stressing up 10 10, verse 10 10. Like when we are approaching by the devotional service to Krishna, uh, he's not the goal. Also, he's stressing up Guru is not the goal. So we come like to this obstacle, Krishna or Guru, but we have to enter into the heart. So Krishna here admits. I'm not the goal, mm -hmm. but the devotee who has topmost position in my heart because I'm acting, I'm doing everything because of this devotee. What I am is because of this devotee. If you want to understand me, you have to come to this position who has this devotee in my heart. So with this process, we are continuing mm -hmm. to come to enter into this. So like, mm -hmm. this is my and also then we can understand why Prabhupada stressed so much uh, emotions and endeavor into Bhagavad Gita. Because then Krishna speaking about his devotee. Gopis, Vedas are gopis. Gopis will not talk about Radharani. They will talk about Krishna. So Prabhupada knowing, you know, in this Krishna, like he maybe enveloped some of the words like here, he's mentioning only like a friend or dear friend, but he's clearly mentioned Priya. So, so for me, like it's uh, like very clear here that Krishna is opening his heart for, uh, for everyone that it's uh, inspired like to, to serve his topmost devotee in his heart. Very nice, thank you. Any others then for sharing? Gopinathapai, you want to share something? Gopinathapai is here. Oh, lovely. Oh, Radhe, Radhe, Radhe. Radhe. Hey, stuff, Radhe, Radhe. Wow. Radhe, Radhe. I got um, what to say. Um, it's so beautiful always to listen because uh, you bring it so, you know, that this text, the Gita, is so profound, right? Mm. And uh, you you keep that profoundness, and at the same time, you add so much sweetness and love in the explanations, sort of. So um, I feel always like you know, it's very ju as I said last time. Also, I think it's very juicy you now the Gita. And I actually I listened uh, one one thing which you said, and that's st stuck to my mind. Um, that um, how much we need this body, mm. you know, for our spiritual practice. And it was so beautiful when you said that we can walk to holy places, we can do dandavats with this body, right? Yes. And, they, and they say in Vrindavan, uh, you know, roll in the dust of Braj. And I was always thinking, you know, why they're saying it? Because actually, um, all the feelings, the bhavas also manifest on the body, right? Yeah. The body, the feelings also like meet. My feelings meet with my body. Right. It's not that feelings are apart from my body, right? I, I can sense it. I get goose pimples. You yeah. know, they say that yeah. the, the sattvic bhavas which you get, um, the, the, the sadhus. And, and we were yesterday reading uh, Saints of Raj. Uh, Shrida was reading to uh, us. And there it was saying that one very famous Babaji from Govardhan, Jack Krishna's Babaji, he was so much in his Manjari Bhav that he, when he was playing holy in his meditation, the color would come on his clothes. Yeah. He would, on his body, it would be colors, you know, of that holy. So, so this is the gift of Mahaprabhu and Mahaprabhu's followers that we can understand that this body is so important for spiritual progress advancement. We have to make it, it as a temple, you no, know, so that the divine can enter, so that Radha can enter. And as Chaitanya just said, so beautiful, Chaitanya Prem, like who is the topmost 
in Krishna's heart, it's Radharani. Of course, and who yeah. should be the top and who should be the topmost in our heart? It should be Swamini. We have to make this temple ready for her to enter. Mm. And Kepa and Gurudev always say she can only enter when the heart becomes nirmal. Nirmal means soft. Ah. Now soft we have to become, no? Soft. Like our Gurudev, when we see him, he's a big person, but sweetness and softness is predominating in him, no? Mm. Soft, very tender. This is the because, challenge. Huh? But yeah. we have to make it for her. Like, I am a very tough guy. I know I have a big ego. I have a heart, you know, my heart is out of stone. But it, I, for her, I want, even Chris, Krishna makes it soft for her. He wants her to enter and live in his heart, no? Yeah. And he's a crooked guy that, you know, it's very difficult to catch him, but her love captures him. So we have to meditate also. We can meditate that, oh, Swamini, you know, I also want you to be in my heart. You know, I want you to come into my heart and live there permanently, not only for a few minutes a day. I want you to be always in my heart. So then I can do everything according to your mood. Then my bhav, the feeling, and my body become your instrument. So uh -huh. I don't know. I'm, I'm a bit talking in uh, senseless no. things. Yeah, this really takes us so, to the next step of what we're saying today. It's so helpful. Thank you.